Well, good morning. My name is Daniel Henderson. I have the privilege of serving here part-time as the prayer pastor and part of the preaching team. And this morning, we continue in our study of the book of 1 Peter, which we have titled Counter Culture. So I invite you to find your Bibles. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. And this morning, we're looking at the text found in chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Our message is titled, Your End Times Lifestyle. As you're turning, I want to remind you about the, just the privilege of what we're doing here this morning of worship. I often say that worship involves revelation and response. It is the response of all that I am to the revelation of all that He is. And we receive that uh, fresh truth and revelation through the songs we sing, the truths in them, now through the teaching of His Word. And then we respond, typically at the end, in singing and expressing praise and surrender. We have a uh, prayer response team available. That's part of our response, to share our hearts with one another, pray for one another, engage in wholehearted support. And uh, just a reminder with that in mind that uh, you don't want to leave early because you actually abort the whole worship process if you do. Uh, we're not done till we're done, and uh, we want to get the fullness of what God has for us. And also, I just encourage you not to leave even when it's over until you feel like you're fully engaged with what God would have you to do to respond, whether it's praying with someone, just remaining behind quietly, maybe applying that message through some of the opportunities to engage in the lobby, and a church that worships well, lives well indeed. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning verse 7, we're going to read in just a moment, but again, I've already mentioned that our title is Your End Times Lifestyle. And the end of the world, as you know, is really mainstream in all of society. Uh, we, when I think of this, I, I had to look up this, this picture I had in my mind of these guys standing on the street holding the sign, the end is near. Uh, we've all seen indications like that. And while I was studying, I found some, some new and interesting renditions of the same idea. Like, here's a, uh, an idea, the end is near. Some of you can relate to that one. <laughs> Here's some ants who are very perceptive about the end of their lives that's about to come. Uh, you see them as well announcing the termination of their existence. When we think about the end being near, we think of things like the Mayan calendar that apparently predicted that we would all be gone in 2012, and yet here we are. Some of you remember Y2K. Uh, when the calendars went from 99 to 2000, and we all thought the world was going to crash and burn, computers would go haywire, nuclear warheads would launch, planes would fall out of the sky, reactors would melt down, and somehow we survived. Now, our culture responds to the end of the world in some interesting ways, one of which is to sensationalize it uh, through movies, etc., that you find in Hollywood, movies like The War of the Worlds, The Day After, The Last Day on Earth, I Am Legend, etc., Many in our culture just dismiss it altogether in kind of a hedonistic lifestyle. Uh, the Bible even quotes it, eat, drink, for tomorrow we die, right? Who cares? My theory is eat, drink, for tomorrow we diet, and uh, yet I don't live that out either. People of faith respond in different ways. I was talking to my brother this week. He's also a pastor, also bald and beautiful, uh, 11 years my senior. He pastors in Oklahoma. And he told me the story of when he was in Bible college, there was a, a classmate of his who was totally obnoxious and obsessed with the return of Christ. And uh, constantly he would get in someone's face and they messed up at all and he'd stick his long finger in their nose and say, brother, you better not be doing that. Jesus is coming again. Do you want Jesus to catch you doing that when he comes? I mean, it was just constant. So finally, his roommates decided it was payback time. They conspired and got their plan together. He went to bed early one night. They fixed the beds with pajamas in between the sheets, piles of clothes in the hallway, showers running, faucets running. And at about 3 a.m., they all went up to the third floor. He's down on the bottom there in the stairwells listening. A guy outside his dorm room blows a trumpet, which is, if you know the Bible, is one of the indications of the calling away of the saints. And uh, he wakes up, and they could hear him screaming and running up and down the halls. Oh, no, and just in a panic. And finally, they said he fell on his knees in the hallway and began begin to repent of sins way worse than anything he had ever pointed out in his roommates' lives. Everybody flooded down the stairwells just laughing their heads off. He left school the next day and was never to be seen again. So uh, be careful how you deal with this subject, right? Uh, over the years, there have been all kinds of false predictions about when the end of the world was going to happen. Uh, even Martin Luther, back in the late 1400s, early 1500s, thought the end was coming. Uh, another denomination, 1533, another denomination, 1844, another denomination in their uh, national newsletter, 1934. 
Even recently, a man who we respect, Chuck Smith, who started Calvary Chapels now with the Lord, he and a guy named Hal Lindsey both wrote books predicting that before 1981, Christ would come again. More recently, there was a guy named Harold Camping on the radio and television who wrote a book, 1994, predicting the coming of Christ. I know because I got five copies, none of which did I read. Uh, When 1994 came and went, he said, I haven't studied enough. Now it's May 21st, 2011. Mm, Didn't happen. Uh, Now famous television preacher John Hagee has a book out called Four Blood Moons, exploring a connection of certain celestial activities of biblical prophecy with the possibility that next year something big is going to happen, could be in the world. Good with me. Uh, but we don't really know, do we? Sometimes we react by overanalyzing and studying and getting into heated debates about the details. Uh, There's a thing called the tribulation in the book of Revelation, seven years of extreme judgment on the earth. And so we have people who are pre-trib. They believe the church will will be out of here before the tribulation starts. There's some who are mid-trib. There's some who are post-trib. I'm a pan-trib. It's all going to pan out. That's all I know. So uh, just keep going, right? Peter's emphasis here is not that we get into all kinds of debates and speculations. His emphasis here is in light of the end, watch how you live. He says, I want you to be intentional and intense, particularly in light of the end of times. Speaking of the end of times, another very famous television program that's out right now on AMC is called The Walking Dead. It's hugely popular, uh, very gross and intense, but uh, it's the idea of zombies taking over the world of the living, and uh, keeps people on edge, from what I understand. Peter's flipping it. He's saying, we are the living in the world of the dead, and we are now carrying to the dead, spiritually dead, a message of life and a message of forgiveness and grace. We are the walking living, and that's really what Peter is emphasizing here. It's a theme that's carried out throughout Scripture. Um, Jesus, and as I think about it, Jesus, when we think of the end times, didn't really Uh, call us, and you see this on the screen, he didn't really call us to figure it out, he calls us to follow him, right? Day by day in light of the end of days. Even the Apostle John and other writers emphasize this. I love the way uh, John, the beloved disciple of Christ, said it. He says it this way, read it aloud with me if you will. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Uh, The hope of his return results in us living more intentionally, more purely, more intensely for Christ. And so let's read what Peter says in 1 Peter 4, 7. As we get there, I want to remind you, this is just good for our souls. It's a good way to live for our own survival and and the grace of God in our lives. He's writing to persecuted beleaguered believers who have been taken from their homes because of the difficulties, and this is good for them. It's good for the health of the church and Of course, I always say that the the hope of the world is Jesus Christ living through a healthy and revived church, and therefore it's good for our society to be attentive to these truths. Here's what Peter says. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And then, verse 10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this morning, as we look at this text, we're going to see, first of all, Uh, the right perspective for end times lifestyles. And then we're going to look at the practice of an end times lifestyle. And finally, the purpose of an end times lifestyle. They all start with P because I went to seminary, got that brain damage, but it's going to help us kind of hang on to the passage here. So let's begin with the perspective that Peter gives us in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is at hand. Literally, he's saying the end is drawing near. It's being readied. And what he really is encouraging us to do is to to live in light of eternity with a sense of urgency, that life is short, eternity is long, people matter, and we need to have an urgency of soul as we think about this reality. Now, Peter probably got some pushback, I'm thinking, on this, because in his second letter, 
uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, he clarified this idea. And I want you to see it just for a moment. He said this, with the Lord, one day is as a, what, thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And he says, the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. I'm guessing some are saying, Peter, what happened? You know, 2,000 years later, we're saying, what happened? He said, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, the delay is because there are still those who need to be reached for the gospel, which again compels us to live intentionally and intensely with eternity in view. He says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Reminds me of the 56-story uh, Republic Plaza in downtown Denver, uh, some uh, 728 feet tall. Picture that building, and then picture a postage stamp on the top of it. The postage stamp represents human history. The rest of the building, eternity. It's a good perspective, isn't it? So God doesn't measure time as we do, but as long as he is tarrying or waiting, we must look at our lives and be as intentional as we can. Of course, another application of this idea at the end is at hand is, I'm closer today than I was yesterday, and so are you. And you'll be closer tomorrow than you were last week. All the more reason for us to really focus the energy and effort of our lives. So let's look at the practice, because Peter now says, therefore, here's how I want you to live. The practice of an end times lifestyle, and there will be four elements, we'll see them very briefly. First of all, an end times lifestyle involves intentional prayer in a self-reliant culture, intentional prayer in a self-reliant culture. I would suggest to you today that the mark of a godless culture is kind of captured in this phrase from the Psalms mentioned twice, where it says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The more little rendering, the fool has said in his heart, no God, or the fool has said in his heart, no God. (laughs) See, the mark of godlessness is who needs God? I have no room for him, no time for him. He's not necessary. And Peter's warning us not to let that creep into our thinking. I say it often, it'll probably be on my tombstone someday, that prayerlessness is my declaration of independence from God. And even though we know Christ in our own subtle ways, we can easily say, no, God, I'm too busy, I don't have time. Uh, We have excuses for not depending on the Lord. Peter says this, I want you to be self-controlled. Do you see that term in your your passage today? It literally means to preserve your sanity, to be in your right mind, to think clearly about what really matters. And we get lots of distraction, don't we, about the things that matter? And then he says, I want you to be self-controlled, or rather sober-minded. And that word literally means spiritual alertness. In your version, it may say awake or alert. It's the idea of being fully engaged. Now, what's interesting to me about this passage is there was a time in Peter's life when he got an F in this category. Three or twice, Jesus called three of his main amigos away with him to pray. You might remember it. One was to a mountain, we call it the Mount of Transfiguration, where they go up for a prayer meeting, Peter, James, and John, and the the text says that there was an appearance of God's glory, Jesus was shining, two Old Testament figures appeared, but when that happened, one of the passages says they woke up. (laughs) So they're up there praying with Jesus, falling asleep right in his presence. So you think Jesus might pick a different three the next time, but same three. This time he's going into the garden before he goes to the cross, and he says, guys, you wait here. I'm going to go in a little further. You watch and pray. Comes back an hour later. Remember what happened? They're out again. He says, what? Could you not watch? Same word. Watch with me one hour. Could you not be self-controlled for one hour to pray? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You've read that verse, right? Peter knows the weakness of that flesh. We know. His writers knew. Peter says... Be disciplined, focused, alert to pray. One of the books I wrote on prayer is called Praising, P-R-A-Y-Z-I-N-G. It's about creative prayer, watchful prayer, wakeful prayer, with stories and, and reasons why we should do that. Because I've learned God's not the author of boredom, especially when we're conversing with Him, right? And we should be alert and awake. Uh, and I'll have to confess, I've led prayer meetings where people have snored, snorted, drooled on themselves, even fallen out of their chair, and they weren't slain in the spirit. You know, they were out like a light. And so I've declared war on sleepy prayer meetings. That's the spirit of what Peter's saying, both individually and collectively. Think about what matters. Be alert, be awake, be engaged, and pray. Pray. Now, there's a word that demands definition, too. 
Because whenever you mention that word, we have different ideas. Some people think of rosary beads. Some people think of kind of this magic genie lamp we rub in order to get our wish from God. Uh, some of us think of a red emergency line phone that we'll use every once in a while when things get really bad. Uh, a mentor of mine, Peter Lord, says most Christians pray out of crisis or from a grocery list, period. And it is much more than that. When you look at New Testament praying, you look at the models of Christ and the apostles and what Jesus taught, uh, I like to define it this way. It's my favorite definition of prayer. You're going to see it on the screen. I think this is what Peter was really talking about, that prayer is intimacy with God that leads to the fulfillment of his purposes. Say that with me. Intimacy with God that leads to the fulfillment of his purposes. That's what Peter had in mind. Draw near to God. Join him in his purposes, good purposes for your own life, for your own growth, your own godliness, your own family, your own ministry. That's really what prayer is. And here at Mission Hills, you know, uh, I've got a kind of a, an affinity for this as the part-time prayer guy. But we're trying to always train you in different electives and classes to be more effective. Staff Chapel this week, we heard wonderful stories about how prayer is making its way into lots of ministries. Um, we have a thing called Powerhouse where every Sunday we invite you to join us to learn to pray, not by hearing about it, reading about it, but by doing it. Uh, on the first weekend of May, I'm so excited, we're doing another prayer summit. You see it in the uh, worship folder. We're going away Thursday night through a Saturday noon. People say, what in the world are we going to pray about for that amount of time? Uh, but there's spontaneous scripture reading and songs and different prayer expressions, time alone with the Lord, time with groups. And this week I heard of someone who was interviewing uh, a couple that went last time, and they said their eyes light up every time they talk about it. Isn't that what you want? You want your eyes to light up when you think about the privilege of prayer? So I hope you'll check that out. Lots of opportunities to do what Peter says. Be sober-minded, self-controlled, so that you may pray. Secondly, an end times lifestyle involves intentional love in an unforgiving culture. Now remember, these believers were being persecuted. It was a very tough time. And you, all, you know and I know the enemy likes to take advantage of us at that moment. And his strategy is divide and conquer, isn't it? Peter says, I've got an antidote for that. Above all, out of this praying, first thing I want you to do is to what? Keep loving one another earnestly. Keep doing what you've done. This is the fourth time he's mentioned this kind of love in this letter. Keep loving one another earnestly. The word earnestly is the, the Greek word for strain. That's what it actually means. It's the picture of a runner pressing toward the finish line with all that he has. And Peter says, with that term in mind, give all that you have to keep on loving one another. Now, last time I had the privilege of speaking on that, we gave you a definition of love. It's not romance, it's not just friendship, but it is the perfect love of God. And here's what it is, I want to remind you that this love Peter speaks of is an act of self-sacrifice flowing from the heart, produced by the Holy Spirit for the good of others and the glory of God. Oh, how we need that, that kind of love for one another. Now, you say, now why do we need to love that way? Glad you asked, Peter answers it right now. Here's why you love. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Wow. Now, that doesn't mean if I love you, God has forgiven your sin through my love. No, only Jesus can forgive your sin. It's borrowed from a passage in the book of Proverbs, a collection of practical wisdom. Love covers a multitude of sins. And what it literally means is that love does not stir up those failings. It does not broadcast or amplify sins. Now, that's counterculture, isn't it? Because everybody loves these expose shows. You know, somebody messed up, let's do a new story. You know, let's find out the gory details. Let's really rub his nose in it. That is anti-Christian behavior. Christian behavior bears and loves and hopes no matter what. It forgives, it understands. And by the way, Peter says there are a multitude of sins. Let's illustrate this. How many of you would be honest when you think about bad thoughts, anger, lust, greed, jealousy, lying, whatever the list is, would say, you know, I sin at least once a day. Now, would you be bold and raise your hand and say, I sin at least once a day. All right, the rest of you either asleep or sinless, I don't know which, or lying, we can address that next week too, but uh, yeah, I sin at least once a day. Now, let's up the ante a little bit. Say, you know, 
I, I even sin three times a day, probably. Anybody admit that? Raise your hand. Okay, look at all this sin going on in here. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, man, you sure sin a lot, but I love you anyway. All right, tell them that. All right, you sure sin a lot, but I love you anyway. <laughs> Uh, it's not only funny, but that's really the application, isn't it? Yeah, it makes me think of the great gospel song by the group Led Zeppelin, Want a Whole Lot of Love, right? Uh, we, we do want a whole lot of love, and you know what? Coming from God through us, it is available. You know, I share the gospel with someone who doesn't know Christ. I often use that illustration of three sins a day. And then we do the math. Three sins a day, 365 days a year, a lifespan about 80 years, so you're going to show up someday before God with 90,000 sins on your account, and when he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven, what will you say? Well, I tried harder, I was good, I went to church, wasn't as bad as the next guy, gong, that doesn't count. The only answer is that I have trusted in the finished work of the perfect Son of God who went to the cross for me, paid the penalty for my sin, has called me to repentance from that sin and perfect and full faith in him and has given me a brand new life and the assurance of heaven. Amen? That's the only answer. 90,000, 100,000, it's all under the blood. Praise God. And today, even as you're listening right now, if you're here and you haven't taken that step, you can make that commitment to Christ as your Lord and Savior who can forgive, cleanse you, and give you a brand new life. We have a table called I Said Yes today. If you're inquiring about that, you have questions, maybe you're making that commitment today, please let us know. We'd love to help as well as our prayer team at the end. And Jesus is the model, isn't he? Hanging between heaven and earth, the perfect son of man, incredible agony, torture, injustice, and yet looks out on the crowd and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Ah, uh, you sure sin a lot, but I love you anyway. Because Christ in me can do nothing else, right? So intentional prayer, intentional love. Thirdly, uh, Peter calls us to intentional hospitality in an isolated culture. Intentional hospitality in an isolated culture. Look at verse 9. He says, now show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And again, think of Peter's day. These believers were homeless and hurting and persecuted. How could they survive without one another opening their homes and their hearts to each other. William Barclay says it this way, without hospitality, the early church could not have existed. They never had any buildings for 200 years. Their homes were the hub of ministry. And I always say the kingdom of God is always built on the stepping stones of relationship. You say, well, Daniel, what about our day? We have buildings and a lot of us, most of us have a place to live. Again, when I think about the importance of hospitality, I think of another great gospel song uh, by the way, you'll learn one of my spiritual gifts is sarcasm. But uh, another great gospel song by the Beatles. Oh, look at all the lonely people, right? That's the story of the day, isn't it? I was reading a news article based on a study by Duke University that said loneliness is getting rampant in America. American circle of close confidants has shrunk dramatically in the past two decades. They also found that the number of people who say that they have no one with whom to discuss important matters has doubled. People without a friend. They said this is because of the scattering of families geographically, a decline in the number of groups to which we typically belong now compared to other years, members of families who spend more time at work and therefore have less time for family bonding and activities, and then new technology which has connected us with people far away but has begun to diminish the face-to-face -face reality of our lives. Hospitality, Peter says, so relevant, isn't it? Open your homes. Do you know it's so important that uh, in the Bible, spiritual leaders, pastors and elders, are required to be hospitable. It's a requirement for them. Uh, in fact, this was illustrated recently on Super Bowl Sunday. You knew I was going to bring that up, didn't you? Uh, Super Bowl Sunday when uh, two elders and one pastor actually invited this family of diehard Seahawks fans to their home to watch the Super Bowl. Now, that's hospitality. Uh, by halftime, it was like a morgue. But, but they weren't grumbling. They weren't complaining. But we, in courtesy, left anyway because we didn't want to rub it in. Nonetheless, I think of that as a picture. Offer hospitality without grumbling. Point really being, you can do the right thing without the right attitude. And he says you need to have the right attitude without grumbling. 
This week in my study, I found one of a a well-known theologian who defined grumbling in this way. I want you to see it. It's so helpful. He says this about grumbling. Grumbling is ultimately complaining against God and his ordering of our circumstances. And its result is to drive out faith, thanksgiving, and joy. So Peter's saying, open your hearts and your homes with faith, thanksgiving, and joy. And we know how our mind plays this, you know. Uh, My house isn't as nice as someone else's. My house isn't as clean as others. My place isn't decorated as well. My place is just an apartment. My landscaping looks bad. My kids are noisy. My home's too hectic. It goes on and on. And not to dismiss those feelings, but I want to remind you of something. It's not your house. It's God's. And he has entrusted it to you as a means of ministry. That's why I'm so excited about the art of neighboring, a practical application in which we do what Peter's telling us we must do. If it was important 2,000 years ago, how much more important now, how much more zealous should we be in an isolated culture like this to demonstrate the practical love and care of Jesus Christ to one another? Fourth practice, intentional service. Intentional service in a consumer culture. Now, we know how this plays out typically. uh, People without Christ will come to an organization, not always, but come to an organization or group, and their mindset is, what's in it for me that I can get out of my involvement here, right? Peter says the believer's attitude is, what's in me that others can receive from my involvement here? And that needs to be our attitude when it comes to church life, right? Because we follow one who said, I have come not to be, what, served? but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. So verse 10, Peter says, As each has received a gift, the word gift there is charisma, charismata. It's the idea of the grace of God that when we come to Christ, works in us to uniquely empower us with abilities to serve the body of Christ. And it's for each one, isn't it? It's not just for seminarians or professionals. Every one of us has been empowered. As we often say, every member is a minister, right? We all have ministry. Notice what uh, Paul said, kind of to complement this. I want you to see the text briefly. Paul said it this way in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. Varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in every one, and to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So Peter says here, you've all been gifted, and you are now stewards of those gifts. They're not your gifts, they're God's. You have to care for them and distribute them in accountability to God. You know, when we get to heaven, I've often thought there will basically be two questions, or to eternity. Not everybody makes it to heaven, but when we get to eternity... Two questions. Number one, what did you do with my son? I think that's the one question. Did you accept him or did you reject him? If you pass that question, I think there's a second one. What did you do with what I gave you? And that's the issue that we have either stewarded or squandered that which God gave us. And we will all be accountable for that, won't we? And so he says, as stewards of the varied, I love that word, the manifold grace of God, the variegated grace of God, another translation is even the multicolored grace of God, like a kaleidoscope. We've all been gifted uniquely and differently to make a difference in the cause of Jesus Christ. And so when it comes to gifts, there are multiple lists. Um, None of the lists is the same. Uh, No one gift appears in all the lists, but in this list, there are two categories, very basic. There are speaking gifts and there are serving gifts, all right? So he says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Now, that could involve preaching, it could involve teaching, but in in a less visible way, it could involve counseling, it could be discipling a child, it could be mentoring a young person. Whatever you're doing that involves speaking is this ministry, and he says, do it as if you're speaking the oracles of God. Now, that does not mean make up whatever you want and blame it on God. You know, God told me. No, that's not it. But when you speak, remember, you're speaking from his word by his power. Over my years of preaching, uh, I need all the help I can get. So I've kept a plaque by my desk for these 30 years. Attributed to John Wesley, it says this, 
God's word sets me on fire and people come to see me burn. (laughs) Don't you like that? God's word sets me on fire and people come to see me burn. Now, admittedly, sometimes my wood is wet, but nonetheless, that's the goal, right? And whether you're counseling, discipling, mentoring, if it involves speaking, let it be God's word setting you on fire. And then there are serving gifts behind the scenes. This could be practical helps, organization, administration, mercy, whatever it is. And he says, similarly, do it with the strength that God provides. Again, going back to 1 Corinthians, we read a moment ago. I want to underscore this one line. Here's what it says. It is the same God who empowers them. What's the next word? All in what? Everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. A couple weeks ago, my wife and I watched a video called The Cross, It's a story of a guy named Arthur Blessed who actually goes to our church, but some of you know him as the dude who carried the cross to all the countries of the world, Guinness Book of World Records, 40,000 miles, and I watched these stories of him going into Northern Ireland and war countries, getting arrested for the gospel, going through jungles and cliffs by himself, his friends deserted him, handing out tracts, sharing with people, praying for them, and I found myself weeping at this endurance, this passion, this love for people, but the Lord began to say to me at the end of that video, Daniel, that same God lives in you. Through your unique gifts, your unique calling. So so let that love, compassion, and power be realized in your life. And you know, you're sitting here today saying, you know, I can't preach like Pastor Mike. Or as I call him, Rom the Bomb. That's my affectionate nickname for him. I can't preach like Pastor Mike, right? I can't evangelize like Billy Graham. I can't organize like Heidi Lopez who runs our kids' ministry. I can't do that. I I can't share compassion like the home and health people. But I want to tell you, friends, the same God, the same Spirit, the same power lives in you that lives in all of them. Now, Peter says, do something. Serve. Don't think about it. Don't have romantic notions. Just do it. And to that end, I just want to remind you, we have a wonderful volunteer team. Uh, They are embedding prayer into their volunteering more and more. We want you to get involved, not for us, but for you. And there's a table out uh, to your left as you walk out called What's Next. You can get information about that. And we have a class called Plugged In where you learn about your gifts. We need you. God desires you. And someday in eternity when you hear the question, what did you do with what I gave you? You can say, I was a faithful steward. Concerning serving, I love what Richard Blackaby said. He said, if you're currently feeling sorry for yourself, (laughs) serve others until the feeling passes. (laughs) So true, isn't it? So let's be really practical. Today, you walk out these doors, let's say the center door here. If you go to your right, you see the art of neighboring. Practice hospitality without grumbling. Right next to that is a table about our prayer summit. Be sober-minded and be awake and alert that you may pray. Walk across the way and there's the the, uh, what's next table and plugged in information. doesn't get any more practical than that. You see, we don't put these things up just to have booths in the lobby. We do that so we can all be actively involved and obedient in fulfilling the word and the will of God. Why? Because the end of all things is at hand. It's a time for intentionality and intensity in serving our Christ. The purpose of it all, very briefly, you see it in verse 11 in order that in everything, in every prayer, in every prayer gathering, in every act of hospitality, in every expression of love, in every act of service, God may be glorified through the person and power of Jesus Christ living through his people. And to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with me as we pray together? As we pray, I've come to believe that one of the most powerful ways to apply God's word is to pray it. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer, invite you in your own heart to respond, make it your own words, your own expression. But Lord, we do come to you now and um, you've set the bar high, but not any higher than your power to help us accomplish it. And I guess, Lord, first we have to yield to you our time because all of this involves the surrender of our time. But because the time is at hand and the end is near, how could we do any less? So with open hands and hearts, we give ourselves to you. Lord, we, uh, we want to live with an intentionality and intensity 
in light of eternity, because as we said, eternity's long, life is short, people matter, and we have to be in the game. So give us grace. Lord, we want to have uh, clear minds, disciplined hearts, an alert spirit so that we may enjoy intimacy with you leading to the fulfillment of your purposes. And then, Lord, out of that relationship, out of that intimacy, out of that abiding, we now want to love one another, Lord. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of sin in here, but we sure love each other, Lord, and help us to to protect, encourage, strengthen, pray, and sacrifice for each other, even as you did for us. Lord, our homes are yours. We open them to you and to others. We pray that ministry will be conducted in practical ways right where we live. And Lord, we ask that you would give us grace to serve. Whether we speak or whether it's behind the scenes, Lord, it's your power in us and help us to be stewards so that in everything, Christ, the living Christ, will be glorified. And Lord, we close with the very final prayer of the New Testament. Revelation 22, when it was said, Come, Lord Jesus. Let's say that together. Come, Lord Jesus. It's his name we pray. Amen.